Hello and welcome to the Swiss Connection. I'm Susan Masika. If you've ever swum on a tropical coral reef, you'll know that it's not only beautiful, but supports an entire ecosystem, providing oxygen to the water, feeding the fish, and attracting tourists. Global warming is decimating our coral reefs, but Swiss and Israeli research has found that corals in the Red Sea are more resistant to climate change. Julia Crawford reports on a Swiss-led project that could provide some hope for the future of this underwater treasure. Switzerland's foreign ministry is backing an innovative Red Sea Coral Research Project led by the Federal Institute of Technology Lausanne, or EPFL. The aim is to get scientists from all the Red Sea countries to work together to study these heat-resistant corals and preserve them. The ministry has promised not money, but diplomatic support to build scientific bridges in this conflict region. I spoke to EPFL's leading coral scientist, Anders Maibom, and asked why the Red Sea corals are so special. What is special about, uh, about the Red Sea is that we have discovered, through some very rigorous testing now, that the corals in the Red Sea can absorb much more warming than elsewhere and still be fine. In fact, at the end of this century, it's projected that we have lost essentially 90% of our coral reefs because the temperature will get too warm. But in the Red Sea, we are quite sure, in the northern part of the Red Sea and in the Gulf of Aqaba, we are quite sure that we have a population that, will, that can withstand these temperatures and still be fine and functioning, and therefore the whole ecosystem will be fine and functioning at the end of the century, provided, of course, that the corals are not killed by local stress, local pollution in the region itself, because you can always kill corals. So the corals are special... Why is it important, according to you, to get all the countries around the Red Sea to work together? This is, this is critical because the, the preservation of, these, of this coral population is a regional challenge. The Red Sea system is not very big. The Red Sea is not, it, it, when you sail on it, it probably looks big, but it's actually as an ocean or as a body of water, and certainly the Gulf of Aqaba are very small bodies of water. And this means that pollution will hit everywhere. So it, it, one country can behave well and protect their corals effectively, but if the neighbor or the one across on the Red Sea is polluting, it will hit everybody. So it's absolutely critical that, that all the countries understand this and they help protect the quality of the water and they help protect the, uh, the, uh, against pollution, etc. Because very, very rapidly, one point of pollution will spread in that small system and can actually do major damage to all the coasts around. In terms of the science, you need to get all the scientists who are specialised in the area to work together. Why do they need you? So EPFL is, is playing this role of coordinator and, and organizer as a neutral partner here. All the different countries have their own capabilities to different levels of doing good science. Getting scientists to work together is not a problem. Everybody is, this is what we do. You know, international scientific collaboration is just in the DNA of, of, of scientific work today. So this is not a problem. But of course, studying the ecosystem uh, the coral reef ecosystem is a very complex thing. And it, there's many, many different tools and scientific approaches that are mixing in. And there is no country alone that has all this expertise in one building or in one institution or, in, you know, as a country even. So what we are doing is we are bringing scientists together from the different regions and even international from other parts of the world, all of which are bringing their own expertise, their own tools, their own methods to the study of the, of the Red Sea. And that's the only way we can really get the total holistic sort of picture of what's going on, on at the ecosystem scale. Switzerland's neutrality, as well as its reputation for science, are also important in this project. EPFL's head of international relations, Olivier Kuttel, explains. If somebody can bring together a scientist in the region of the Red Sea, so it's likely that Switzerland can do it. You know, given the status we have, the acceptance uh, uh, in the region. So that's the other element, why EPFL and why Switzerland. So it's really to play this neutral role 
facilitating meetings, bringing researchers together, make sure that researchers get visa to, to, to visit each other, maybe set up an expedition where we can, you know, uh, uh, monitor kind of the baseline, what, what's, what's around in, in the Red Sea. But this needs somebody from the outside, because as we know, you know, the region, it's a very conflictual area. So you need this kind of moderator, neutral country, and Switzerland can perfectly play that role. And um, how important is the role of the foreign ministry in this project? Well, the role is very important, actually, because, you know, it's not just a science project where actually you bring together scientists, you bring together science, or let's say the aim is to bring together scientists from part of the world, which is a region around Red Sea, which, as we know, you know, it's a very conflictual area. So, I mean, there's no way that we can do it just as scientists. So there are a lot of hurdles, political hurdles, diplomatic hurdles, where actually, you know, we need to support and actually we have it. That's, that's actually, you know, the beauty of the project. So it's something in between or it has both sides. So it's about science, but it's, it's science in a region where actually you need the diplomatic support to make this happen. I mean, do you think that as well as helping science, which we hope this will, that this could also help to promote peace in the Middle East? I mean, hopefully... Let's, let's put it that way. I mean, the first step would get, you know, let's say common research projects where researchers, you know, around the Red Sea from the different countries could work together. I mean, that would be already a big step because today it's not the case. And that's, I would say, a first step. Now, it will certainly impact, you know, the peace process. To what degree, it's probably qu quite early to say but nevertheless, I mean, bringing people together to work together on a scientific issue where all the political, let's say, the political background, it's, it's, it's bold and difficult to work with. I mean, like, take CERN. CERN was the exact example of what ha happened after the Second World War. Why is it in Geneva? Well, one of the reasons was actually it was a neutral, Switzerland is a neutral country. And actually it was the first subject, you know, the working together on, in science it's less political. So actually people and countries are more open. You know, let's start with the, the scientific collaboration and then maybe something can grow out of it, something, you know, on, on, on other levels, but on the basis which is uh, uh, science. So could researching the heat-resistant corals in the Red Sea also help to save corals elsewhere? I put the question to scientist Anders Maibom. So, you know, the big, the one million dollar question is if we can take corals from the Red Sea and transplant them and move them into the Great Barrier Reef, for example. Uh, at the moment, or in other places, at the moment, this is not possible. Uh, the conditions in the Red Sea are so sufficiently different from in other reefs, for example, the Great Barrier Reef, that if you take a coral from the Red Sea and put it in, in Australia and the Great Barrier Reef, it, it may survive, but it will not be very happy, most likely it will die. The temperatures are different, the salinity is different, there's a lot of environmental conditions that are different. But, of course, this is the situation now. But we all know how fast uh, science is progressing in the biological science, in the life sciences. There are so many things happening at the level of DNA, etc. So, uh, you know, there's clearly a hope that in the future we might be able to develop corals that could actually survive, even under the warmer conditions, in, in, in different places. But this requires that we have this stock, that we have a healthy stock of corals, which we might have in, if we protect the Red Sea corals, we might have this stock to work with. And there's, there's very serious work going on right now in, in different labs uh, around the world trying to, do, um, to, to tune the corals, including in the Red Sea, tune them to the, the harsher and harsher condi climatic conditions that they're facing. When I say tune, I mean it, it, there's a phenomenon or a process that we call assistant ev evolution. So you, you're trying to stress the corals in a moderately moderate way, and some of them will not like it, and some of them will, and we select those that, are, that are then can cope with, it, with this amount of stress to accelerate the, evolu the evolution towards more and more resistant corals. And some of these corals we might actually be able to move around in the future. <laughs> 
That was Julia Crawford reporting on an innovative Swiss-led coral research project, which is still seeking funding to become operational. Visit us at swissinfo.ch for more on this story, as well as other examples of science diplomacy with Swiss involvement. The Swiss Connection is a podcast where we talk to newsmakers based in Switzerland, as well as Swiss people living abroad. We produce a new episode every few weeks. Subscribe on Apple Podcasts or another platform to be sure you don't miss the next one. Thanks for listening, and thank you to studio technician Donnie Wheeler. Signing off for all of us here, I'm Susan Masika. Do you want to polish your knowledge about Swiss elections, referendums and political parties while at the same time learning more about the quirks of the political system in Switzerland? If that's the case, our newsletter course is just what you need. Each week for a month, we'll send you a free instalment explaining the most important details of how Swiss democracy works. Our course teaches you who's eligible to vote in Switzerland, what the different parties stand for, how election and popular vote results are implemented, and what distinguishes Swiss democracy from other political systems. Our crash course is interactive, like democracy itself. Your questions will be answered on an FAQ page, and you can debate with other users and share your inputs and opinions. We will also provide links to multimedia articles and videos to help you better understand the Swiss democratic system. Please join us and sign up for the free Democracy Crash Course newsletter at www.swissinfo.ch slash democracy. That's www.swissinfo.ch slash democracy.